So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce one of our interventional fellows. This year was the first year that we had um, actually two interventional fellows. So from here on, we're lucky to, to have two individuals that are highly trained and highly talented. And one of them is uh, Yash. Um, Yash joined us uh, ultimately from um, a program, a Mount Sinai program in New York, uh, during which he interviewed with us, but he trained um, at the uh, Kasturba Medical College in Mangalore, uh, India. He also did an internal medicine training at the uh, Jacobi Medical Center in Albert Einstein College of uh, Medicine uh, in New York. And as I said, then continued in cardiology, was e even a chief cardiology fellow um, there. Yash um, not only was one of the first, um, or is the first, a fellow who um, trains in a two-fellow program, but he also is the first who actually um, applied and then also made it through the uh, vigorous interview process to become a structural heart disease fellow. So it's a lot of firsts for him and for us. So he's going to continue to be um, our next year's or this year's uh, structural heart disease fellow, which is also exciting. Uh, Yash is going to talk about an update in uh, antithrombotic therapy after PCI, and I can say that Yash, I think, um, published a paper with, with uh, us um, before he actually started the intervention program, and looking at his bio yesterday, um, he worked definitely with a structural heart disease group already on publishing papers, and I think Manos was one of his mentors, so he can allude to that, but he's very productive, very engaged. Both fellows are. Uh, we're really lucky, so I'm um, happy to hear Yash talk today, and I will stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Gessel. Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk about something very relevant to all of us, and which was uh, antithrombotic therapy, which is sort of a uh, ever-evolving field. Um, so, you know, I think this is quintessential in the field of cardiology and interventional cardiology, where we have to balance ischemia with bleeding, sort of the holy grail of, uh, of the cath lab. So I'm going to use four commonly encountered clinical scenarios um, to sort of go over what trials are there, relevant data, and some of the new trials in the last couple of years uh, that I think we should all know about. So, you know, we must know that bleeding is bad and MIs are bad. Um, you know, you... Within the first year after PCI, if you have either of these two, you're going to have a bad outcome. Um, more severe bleeding almost always equates to a high risk of mortality. So I'm going to talk about scenario one. You know, 10% of our patients uh, coming to the cath lab now have atrial fibrillation or are on a, on a blood thinner. And there's always this conundrum about, you know, what do we do with their antiplatelet therapy, their anticoagulant therapy? So I'm going to sort of start, uh, you know, historically, this was probably the first trial that sort of uh, shook paradigms. Uh, at this point, we believed, okay, triple therapy for all is probably the way to go. Um, but I think the worst trial which was done in, in the Netherlands uh, was a randomized trial where we randomized around about 600 patients to two arms. One arm was uh, Coumadin with Plavix and the other arm was Coumadin, Plavix and Aspirin, which is our triple therapy. Uh, these patients were followed up to about a year and what we found was there was a significant drop in bleeding if you were, if you were not on Aspirin. And even the uh, secondary outcomes, which are a composite of basically ischemia and death, also favored dual antithrombotic therapy. Um, the rationale for this trial was, you know, at that time we had learned that the risk of bleeding is probably highest within one month post-PCI. So we want to see what intervention could be done to reduce that. And I think the trialists did a pretty good job here. So afterwards, we started questioning the paradigm of um, triple therapy for, for all or for a year. Then a couple of years later came the ISAR triple trial. The purpose of this trial and the way it was designed was, again, randomized. Uh, both groups got triple therapy, but the point of randomization was the duration of the second antiplatelet or clopidogrel. So group A got six weeks of Plavix, group B got six months of Plavix, and then we followed up these patients for around about nine months. And we found really no difference in primary outcomes, which were inclined towards ischemia and bleeding. So eyes are triple, and this is the landmark analysis. So by landmark, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're enrolled in a trial, uh, 
and the endpoint is six weeks and six months. So really what happened between six weeks and six months, we found that there was actually more bleeding in patients who had six months of, uh, of uh, triple therapy versus patients who just got six weeks. Um, so ISAR triple really taught us, um, sorry, ISAR triple really taught us that, hey, listen, maybe six weeks of a second potent antiplatelet versus six months is probably safe. Again, we're sort of in this era, we're trying to decrease duration of triple therapy. Um, then, you know, I think these were four pivotal trials uh, that we must all know about. Um, at this point in 2016, the FDA had already approved all four NOACs for therapy for atrial fibrillation. So the trialists said, hey, if it works in AFib, let's see if patients who are getting PCI can get benefit from these drugs as well. So the first of the four trials was Pioneer AF. Uh, this was done in 2016. So around about 2,000 patients were now randomized into three groups. Group A was rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams with a P2Y12 inhibitor. This was like the worst like arm. Remember in the worst trial, this is what the trialists did. Arm number two was a low dose rivaroxaban, which was 2.5 milligrams BID, along with aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. And then once we drop the P2Y12 inhibitor, we just convert our rivaroxaban from this low dose to a normal dose. And this actually resembled something which was done maybe five years before, which was the Atlas ACS TIMI trial, which actually said probably an addition of low dose rivaroxaban could reduce ischemic outcomes. And then the third group was our conventional control coumadin based triple therapy. And really what we found here was similar efficacy um, across the groups, but significant safety uh, towards the groups that were based with rivaroxaban. It's also important for us to remember that in this trial, patients were randomized three days after their PCI. So that means they all got aspirin for at least three days, and then they were randomized into their, um, their usual arms. The second trial was the Reduel PCI. So this was based on dabigatran. So at that time, this was a randomized trial. Here we have sort of four arms. So we have one treatment, which is dabigatran, 110 milligrams twice a day, along with a P2Y12 inhibitor. Second one was dabigatran, 150 milligrams twice a day with a P2Y12 inhibitor. And the same control groups were based on Coumadin. Again, in this trial, actually all patients got at least five days of aspirin post-PCI and uh, prior to their randomization. So what we found, we found, well, on follow-up of two years, uh, both the low dose and the 150 milligrams twice a day favored primary endpoints compared to the Coumadin-based arms. There was no difference in secondary endpoints. However, there is an editorial comment to be made here. The first one is, uh, in the US, we don't have the 110 milligrams twice a day. And also this lower dose dabigatran, actually, there was a slightly higher trend towards numerically higher stent thrombosis and MI uh, in these groups. So in both these trials, now it's unclear if the low bleeding events were they attributed to the use of these DOACs, which are sort of the new kids on the block, or was it due to dropping aspirin? And we didn't know that because there was really no placebo arm. Almost everyone got aspirin. So then came Augustus in 2019, and this was a trial with Eliquis. This was very well powered, probably the biggest of the three. 4,600 patients, and here we had the advantage of having a placebo arm. So the patients were randomized to Eliquis plus a P2Y12 inhibitor plus aspirin, or the other treatment arm was Eliquis with a P2Y12 inhibitor and placebo, and their corresponding groups, uh, which were on Coumadin. So, you know, when we look at the kaplan meier uh, survival curves, we find primary endpoints of major bleeding really favored anyone who was on Eliquis compared to Coumadin. In addition, patients who were on aspirin actually had more bleeding than those who were on placebo. And secondary endpoints of death and hospitalization also favored patients on Eliquis. So Augustus, now it's 2019, and Augustus uh, helps us disentangle that the individual contribution and of DOAX and aspirin withdrawal on the risk of bleeding. So perhaps, you know, letting go of aspirin early is probably better. 
And then finally, this was the last of the four. This was the Intrust AFPCI trial on idoxaban. So here, um, patients came in, uh, were randomized to idoxaban plus a B2 vitrol inhibitor. So this dual antithrombotic therapy versus triple therapy with Coumadin. And patients, all of these patients got at least five days of aspirin uh, before they were randomized and after their PCIs. And again, in this trial, really, there was uh, no difference in secondary outcomes, but primary outcomes of bleeding favored um, the NOAC-based groups. So subsequently, you know, this was published in the European Heart Journal. So for all four trials which were published till now, we did a meta-analysis. And what did we find? We found that if you're based out of a NOAC strategy, you have lower major bleeding. You have a lower risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, and, but there was a trend towards actually higher MI and stent thrombosis in patients who got dual therapy versus triple therapy. Subsequently, there was another meta-analysis, which I haven't shown here, I'd done a year later, um, that said perhaps there's no difference uh, in MI and stent thrombosis with dual versus triple therapy, um, and perhaps there's only a numerical trend. Now, it's important to remember that it's very hard to really design a trial where ischemia-driven endpoints are your primary endpoints, just because it'll be, you'll need many, many tens of thousands of patients. That's why if you see most of the trialists till now have really designed these trials uh, where their primary endpoints were based on bleeding events. So now my second scenario, again, related to scenario number one is um, how do I manage my patient a year out in clinic and he has AFib, he had a PCI before, what do I do? And what data do we have really to support our decisions? So there are really only two trials out there. Uh, so this is number one. So 2019, this trial called as OAC alone, uh, randomized patients at one year to either get a blood thinner, which was either a DOAC or vitamin K antagonist, or get dual antithrombotic therapy, which was either a blood thinner along with either aspirin or Plavix, really left to the discretion of the treating physicians. Now, what we found was it took three years to only get 700 patients here. And the biggest problem was that there was a lot of reluctance from cardiologists to withdraw the antiplatelet at one year and enroll these patients into the trial. Unfortunately, the trial was terminated early because of slow enrollment and wasn't really powered. So if you see sort of both the you know, primary and secondary endpoint curves are sort of parallel to each other, really no difference. But again, there was a, a slightly higher trend towards stent thrombosis and MI uh, in patients who did not get uh, antiplatelet therapy beyond one year. Now, does this mean anything? I'm not sure. Perhaps if the trial was continued and better powered, we could have had a better conclusion. And then the FIR trial came out of Japan. Um, so this trial, similarly, patients at a year were randomized to either Zorelto, which is Roxaban, or Roxaban plus an antiplatelet. They were followed up for around two years. And this trial is actually terminated early because there was a a significant signal towards more bleeding in patients who had dual treatment or dual antithrombotic therapy. Um, again, it's, I think, uh, an important contribution to sort of this OAC-only uh, uh, sort of line of treatment at the end of 12 months. So I think this was a, a very important uh, document that came out, just the who's who of sort of antithrombotic and antiplatelet therapy in the country put together this document in 2018 and subsequently updated this in 2021. And what they're suggesting is, so how should we approach these patients? So I think it's very important that we understand what their bleeding risk is and what their ischemic risk is. We understand factors that put them at a high risk of bleeding. And they've proposed a criteria according to their, con this, their committee saying that if you have one major criteria uh, and or two minor criteria, this would put you at a high risk of bleeding. So for example, minor criteria would be an age of more than 75 or a hemoglobin of less than, less than uh, 11 would be a, a major criteria. If you were on a blood thinner, that would again be a major criteria. And thrombotic risk was essentially defined based on uh, did you present with an ACS or, or did you have your intervention for stable ischemic heart disease? 
If you have an ACS, you have a greater thrombotic risk. And the next thrombotic risk was really based upon PCI complexity. How complex was your PCI? How many stents were used, left vein spirifications, vein graft interventions? What was really done to understand you know, what this patient's thrombotic risk is? So this sort of came about as their, sort of their guidelines uh, where they divided patients into default, high ischemic risk, and then low ischemic risk, and what should be done. So I'm just going to skip to sort of the high ischemic, low bleeding risk patients and the low ischemic, high bleeding risk patients and what should be done. So if you think your patient is at a high ischemic risk based on, let's say he had a STEMI and we did bifurcation stenting, uh, put two stents in, and his bleeding risk is low, he's a younger guy, doesn't have any other risk factors for bleeding, probably the best thing to do is triple therapy for a month followed by dual therapy so you can drop your aspirin and then perhaps continue only a blood thinner at 12 months. The other arm is, let's say someone has a low ischemic risk at a high bleeding risk. So this would be your 80-year-old patient who's coming in with a sort of angina or an abnormal stress test and gets one stent put into her RCA, for example. Now, um, this consensus says probably this patient should come in, get aspirin loaded, get a few days of aspirin while she's in-house with us, drop the aspirin and send her home on dual therapy, which means Plavix, for example, with her blood thinner. Do this for six months, and then at six months, you can drop her second antiplatelet and just do a blood thinner. Now, why is this, where are we getting this obsession with one month of aspirin, one month of aspirin? So, you know, trials in the past have shown that your thrombotic risk is really highest within the first 30 days after PCI. So the Augustus trial, this was a post hoc analysis that basically showed when we compared patients on aspirin versus placebo, in the first 30 days, you can see the curves diverging, there was more bleeding with aspirin, but less ischemic events with aspirin. Beyond 30 days, there was still more bleeding with aspirin, but there was no difference in ischemic events. And this sort of put, you know, kind of solidifies that a month of aspirin is probably more than enough in, in all of these patients. Um, these were the guidelines at that point. So we have guidelines from ACC, ESC, and then the consensus document here. Just, uh, just quickly highlighting, so what do the Europeans say? They're saying perhaps if you have intervention for stable ischemic heart disease, you get aspirin, again, dur in duration of your hospitalization, maximum for up to a week, um, and then you probably do six months of dual therapy, which is an OAC plus a B2Y12 inhibitor. Uh, you can do three months if your bleeding risk is high. And similarly, if you have an ACS, you can probably do this dual therapy for 12 months and six months if your bleeding risk is high. So choosing the right DOAC, again, this is a sort of... Uh, I won't go over this in, in detail, but a few things, few caveats to remember now that we have more and more trials with these DOACs is um, the representation in all sort of different trials. Um, in the AFib and PCI trials, we must remember one thing, which is rivaroxaban was dosed only at 15 milligrams, even though in your AFib trials it was 20 milligrams. So if you have a patient with AFib on 20 milligrams coming in with an acute coronary syndrome, getting a PCI before you discharge him, please drop him to 15 milligrams. Uh, so that's one thing. The other caveat is most of the trials on PE and DVT had a loading, either parenteral loading or a, or a loading for seven days uh, with a DOAC before the patients were actually put on sort of maintenance therapy. And then in terms of renal dysfunction, this is always a dilemma. Um, so Eliquis is really the only one that's uh, safe uh, given it's, uh, the way it's metabolized to be used in end-stage renal disease patients. Um, all the other three DOACs have an FDA stamp that they can be used between 15 and 50 GFR. Dabigatran, interestingly, the way the trial was designed, the low dose can be used in patients with a GFR between 15 and 30. Again, I think this is something important to know. Now, there are more trials on TAVR, bioprosthetic valves, which I think are important to consider, and I have just left out for the sake of time um, today. So in summary, you know, given scenario one and two that we're encountered with, I think we have enough data now to say that if your patient can get a NOAC, uh, you know, don't have a mechanical valve, don't have severe MS, 
Uh, it's probably better than vitamin K antagonist. Plavix is probably better when you're considering dual or triple antithrombotic therapy. Aspirin, probably for the stay of the hospitalization, is enough, unless you're concerned about a very high thrombotic risk. And then before or after, when you're seeing your patients, know your thrombotic risk, know your bleeding risk. This, let that guide your therapy. And then OAC alone at one year, uh, perhaps is, is, is the way to go in the future. And, you know, perhaps we'll have more studies um, sort of in this realm. Scenario number three, I think this is probably the most challenging and nerve-wracking scenario for all of us, which is, um, so my patient now has an NSTEMI. She has a diagnosis of breast cancer, and she needs surgery ASAP. So what do I do? So these are now patients who are high bleeding risk, and we're going to now talk about some short DAPT scenarios. So what the, these are sort of three things that we all think about, whether inside the lab or we're seeing these patients in the office. And the dilemma is, which stent do we use? Do we use a bare metal or one of the newer stents on the shelf? How long should we treat for? And are we doing DAPT for a month or, and followed by aspirin? Are we doing DAPT for a month followed by Plavix? Is there a difference? Um, so I'm going to just show some, some sort of... Um, trials in this uh, in this realm. So the evolution of DAPT, so, you know, it's been 25 years sort of since we've learned about stents and DAPT and blood thinners. So we can divide that into sort of three eras. Era, the early 90s to early 2000s was the era of thrombosis. We were very concerned about our first generation stents and bare metal stents clotting, and we were putting patients on warfarin and aspirin. We then learned about clopidogrel and ticlopidin and subsequently had first-generation stents. Then we sort of moved into this era between 2005 and 2015, where now we had newer stents, more potent second antiplatelets, and we were now more concerned about bleeding than anything else. And we were talking about how can we reduce bleeding in our patients. And now I think the last five years we've entered this sort of a realm of equipoise where we have much safer, safer stand platforms. Um, we have learned about shorter DAPT and, and sort of see what can be done to even reduce bleeding risk further. So the last set of guidelines from the ACCHA were 2016, ESC was 2017, and then later on I'm going to show you 2020. For the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on what do they say about high bleeding risk patients. So basically, if you come in with an abnormal stress stress and you have stable ischemic heart disease, you get a stent placed. Uh, the U.S. guidelines say three months of DAPT. The, American, the European guidelines say one to three months. If you have ACS and you're coming in, get a stent placed, and you have a high bleeding risk, both the U.S. guidelines uh, down here and the, uh, the European guidelines say six months of DAPT. So now, dilemma number one, which stent do we ask for? So this trial sort of, again, shook paradigms when it was uh, published. So 2015 came out in the New England Journal where patients with high bleeding risk, they were randomized to get either a bare metal stent or a stent platform called as BioFreedom, which is a drug-coded stent. These patients were followed up for a year. The primary endpoints for safety were driven by death MI stent thrombosis which was all very relevant, and efficacy was driven by TLR. Everyone got a month of DAPT followed by aspirin. So what we found is you can see clearly the curves are diverging. So at around about 45 days, the curves diverge, and there were much higher events in patients getting bare metal stents, uh, much more higher events of TLR as well in these patients. So at till this point, you know, the paradigm was 12 months of DAPT for ACS, six months for stable ischemic heart disease, and probably everyone could get a BMS. But I think this trial was the first to challenge that. Then a year later came this post-hoc analysis from the ZEUS trial. The ZEUS trial was based on patients who got this Zotarolimus saluting stent called as Endeavor Spirit, which is no longer available. These patients were randomized one-to-one -one, uh, with patients getting bare metal stents. Primary outcome was a composite of ischemic endpoints and death. Everyone got a month of DAP followed by only aspirin. And we found a significant reduction on follow-up at a year of death, TVR, stent thrombosis together, and even when these endpoints were looked um, separately. Then came Leaders Free 2 in 2018, just three years ago. So here, again, this was the same group who did Leaders Free 1, 
three years ago. So here we took um, the same biofreedom stent. We looked at, we randomized patients to get that stent, and we compared uh, outcomes with patients who had gotten bare, the bare metal stent in leaders free one back in 2015. And at 12 months, we found lower TLR, lower death, and lower MI in patients getting this uh, stent uh, versus a bare metal stent, even though they just got a month of DAP. And this trial actually led to the approval of the BioLimus A9 stent. And I don't think we have that in our lab here. Um, so this was sort of the headlines uh, three years ago in TCT after this trial was presented is, you know, is there really an end for bare metal stents? Should they be on our shelf? And um, in the corner here, you can see the guidelines from European, uh, the Europeans, which was published this year, really saying that there's no need for uh, bare metal stents. If you're thinking about bare metal stent, just put in a drug looting stent and you should probably do well, well enough. Um, some Now, again, some sort of uh, groundbreaking trials in the last 24 months or so that I'm going to talk about um, on high bleeding risk patients, getting short dapped, and, and what the authors found. So Onyx-1 was a big trial. 2,000 patients um, were enrolled. Here, we patients were randomized to uh, the Resolute stent versus the Biofreedom stent, which we learned about in the Leaders Free trial. And here our outcomes were, primary outcome was, again, composite of ischemia and death. And everyone got a month of DAP followed by aspirin only. And what we found was really there was no difference in outcomes with both these drug eluting stents. One which we already knew we can do well with in uh, short DAP. And the other one, which was the study stent, which was resolute, we now found out that you know it did equally or as well as uh, as the biofreedom stent, even though we just had one month of DAPT and we have a year of follow-up. Uh, our editorial comment here is there were higher than normal ischemic and bleeding events in these patients and higher than normal rates of stent thrombosis. So stent thrombosis rates usually across most of the new stent platforms are less than 1%. In this trial, there were around about 2 to 2.5% stent thrombosis at one year. And perhaps this patient was really high risk, and that is why you know, we saw what we did. But nonetheless, once this trial was published last year, the FDA gave a stamp of approval for the Resolute on extent for high bleeding risk patients. This is a stent that we have in our lab. Um, then came again, last year was a good year for high bleeding risk patients. The Zions 28 and Zions 90 trials, which were based on the Everolimus eluding stent. Uh, this was not randomized, but patients were sort of enrolled into either the 30-day arm or the 90-day arm. And we, con and we compared outcomes of these patients to patients who had gotten uh, the Zion stent in another trial. And really, when we looked at outcomes of one month versus 12 months of DAPT or three months versus 12 months of DAPT, we found no differences in ischemic endpoints, which was great. And we found a significant reduction in major bleeding with just with short DAPT. So once this trial was presented last year, the Europeans got CE marked um, Zions for short DAPT in high bleeding risk patients in Europe. So now coming to the ACS patients, which is sort of another beast. You know, these patients are at the highest thrombotic risk. Till now, the trials that I've talked about sort of included all comers. We had patients who had HCS, patients who had stable ischemic heart disease, but nothing really that was only on patients with acute coronary syndrome. So the first of its kind, uh, this trial was published in 2018, called as the DAP-STEMI trial, published in uh, BMJ. Here, patients who actually came in with a STEMI were randomized to the Resolute stent, and they got either six months of DAPT or 12 months of DAPT. And they were all followed up for around about 24 months. Um, again, in terms of the second antiplatelet therapy, it was sort of a mix of Plavix, Ticagrelor, and Prasugrel, really left to the choice of the treating physician. And what we found was at 24 months, if you look at the, the plot, the red line is for DAPT and the blue one is for single antiplatelet therapy. Really, primary outcomes tended to favor single antiplatelet therapy. There were similar bleeding outcomes. And you know this sort of led the ground that, hey, maybe we should shorten our, uh, our therapy for 
for from 12 months to six months in patients who are at a high bleeding risk, even though they're coming in with acute coronary syndrome. Then we had the SMART DATE trial in 2018. This was published in the Lancet. It came out of Korea. Again, multiple centers. Here we looked at six months versus 12 months of DAPT. Patients were coming in with all sorts of acute coronary syndrome. There was no one particular stent. There were three different stent platforms used. And what we found was that at six months, six, so when we compared six to 12 month strategy, we found significantly more MIs in patients who only had six months. And there was a trend towards more MACE in patients who had six months versus 12 months. You know, completely different from the trial that I just told you about. Um, and there could be some reasons why this happened. You know, this trial was based in South Korea. I'm not sure how much IVUS use was used there. Uh, patients uh, who are Southeast Asian or are thinner. Um, obese patients tend to do, need more P2 vitro inhibitors. So there are certain hypotheses, and we're not really sure why there was this difference in, in both these trials. So I think in summary, uh, thus far from what we've discussed, probably bare metal stents are going to be obsolete. Um, simple coronary lesions or when you're treating stable ischemic heart disease, yes, the guideline says six, but you can probably do three even as low as one, and get away with a new generation drug eluting strength in high bleeding risk patients. You have a complex lesion subset, two stents, left mains, acute coronary syndromes. Guidelines, yes, they say 12 months, but you can probably do six and even get away with three months in high bleeding risk patients. So now this was sort of the newest concept in the DAPT arena, which is short DAP followed by a P2Y12 inhibitor. This was something that was not done before. The first time it was done in 2019 with the Twilight trial. So what was the Twilight trial? 8,000 patients who were felt to have complex coronary disease uh, were enrolled. They were randomized to, after their PCI, they were randomized to either get aspirin and Plavix for three months, followed by uh, Plavix monotherapy versus aspirin and, and, and sorry, Brillinta for 12 months. So. As you can see, what we found was patients who got Brillinta monotherapy versus those who were continued on aspirin and Brillinta actually had less bleeding. And there was no difference in ischemic endpoints in patients when they were followed up for 12 months. This sort of opened up the doorway for uh, P2Y12 only monotherapy uh, at the end of a short duration of DAPT. <coughs> In the same year, we had the STOP DAP2 trial. Uh, this was published in JAMA. This was a randomized trial comparing one month of DAP, this time followed by clopidogrel monotherapy versus 12 months of DAP. The stent platform used here was the Zion stent. We had a year of follow-up for these patients. And what we found out was that shorter DAP led to significantly lower bleeding and there was really no difference in ischemic or ischemia-driven endpoints in these patients at 12 months. Um, again, this trial was done in Japan, so how much of intracoronary imaging is used? I mean, they're very high users of intracoronary imaging. Perhaps that's why there was a difference uh, and why one month worked as well as 12 months. It's just speculation or editorial comments. I'm not sure. And this finally was the... Tyco trial, so this was the Orsero ultra-thin uh, strut stent, which is also available in our lab. Uh, patients who got this stent were randomized to either three months of DAPT with a ticagrelor-based arm, followed by ticagrelor monotherapy, or aspirin and ticagrelor for 12 months. All these patients uh, were an ACS subset. Uh, the complexity of included patients was lower, not as many complex patients, for example, as the Twilight trial. But here we found that there was a significant decrease in bleeding with just three months of therapy followed by ticagrelor monotherapy. There was also a significant decrease in, in NACE, which is net adverse cardiovascular events. And this is sort of a new term in these 10 trials. And this really includes uh, events aligned towards ischemia and bleeding. Sorry, ischemia and mortality. So I think till now, in summary, I would say Complex anatomy, ACS patients, ticagrelor is probably the way to go over Plavix. Short DAP, as low as three months, followed by P2 Y12 inhibitors in high bleeding risk patients, is a very promising um, 
a, a sort of regimen of DAP therapy. Again, this is some editorial comments from um, which we've talked about, you know, higher BMIs, reduced pituitary inability, uh, uh, intensity. Perhaps that's why, you know, when we compare studies from U.S. versus Southeast Asia, maybe that's why there's a difference. East Asians are usually known to have some degree of poor clopidogrel metabolism. And again, there's a higher... Uh, use of intracoronary imaging in, in, in Korea and Japan compared to the U.S., perhaps that could also uh, have sort of influenced outcomes. So time for new guidelines. Um, the Europeans just came up with guidelines on ACS and guidelines on stable ischemic heart disease. So what are they saying? So they're saying, like what we had talked about, you first define your patient's bleeding risk. Is the patient low, high, or very high? And by very high, I mean someone who's bled in the past month or someone who's getting urgent or emergent surgery within the next couple of weeks. So perhaps these patients, you give them aspirin Plavix, and then you just do Plavix monotherapy, and that should work. And that was one of the trials I had showed you. If you're at a high bleeding risk um, and some sort of moderate ischemic risk, you can probably do DAPT for three months followed by aspirin monotherapy. And then if you're at a low bleeding risk, now you have to look at, okay, what strategies do I have? And you can sort of modify them based on your ischemic risk. So your options for low bleeding risk are you do your DAP for 12 months, uh, followed by either, you know, probably aspirin monotherapy beyond that. Or you do DAP for three months like twilight, and then you do ticagrel or monotherapy thereafter. They have actually, interestingly, if you see in the left lower corner, have also recommended that at a year, you could stop your second antiplatelet agent, just continue aspirin, and add low dose rivaroxaban. Sort of the, what we had learned in the COMPASS trial, they have put into their guidelines here as well, saying that you know these patients still may have had slightly higher bleeding, but do get protection from ischemia. In terms of guidelines on stable ischemic heart disease, six months is something we know about, but now they're saying, okay, think about your bleeding risk. If you're at a high bleeding risk, consider three. If you're at very high, consider one month of DAP. And again, some of the trials like Onyx 1 that I had showed you, uh, patients did very well with just one month of DAP and in the setting of high bleeding risk. Um, so scenario number four, I think this scenario does not have as much data. You know, my patient now had a PCI 15 years ago with a first generation stent. I inherited him in clinic and he's still on DAP and I need to go on to single antiplatelet therapy, what are my options? So there are really only six trials that were done in this, uh, in this realm that compared six to 12 versus up to 30 to 48 months of DAPT. And all of them were really negative. So there's only one trial, which was the DAPT trial, which was published in the New England Journal in 2014, showed that there is probably ischemic protection in patients with prolonged DAPT, but at the cost of major bleeding. A subsequent meta-analysis uh, of short, uh, sorry, less than 12 months versus more than 12 months of DAPT was done, and we found that, yes, more than 12 months of DAPT is probably okay. It probably is fine in patients who have ACS, but not stable ischemic heart disease. And the caveat is there is always going to be a trend towards higher bleeding the longer you prolong your DAPT. And I think this was a very well done network meta-analysis just this last year, comparing sort of all these permutations of short DAP, long DAP, six months DAP, you know, DAP followed by aspirin, DAP followed by P2Y12 inhibitor. And the summary is, if you are getting more than 12 months of DAP compared to the other treatment strategies, you probably have the best reduction in your MI, but at the cost of highest bleeding. And if you're, and then the other strategy is less than three months of DAPT followed by a P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy versus 12 months of DAPT, there's really equipoise in ischemic endpoints and there's a reduction in bleeding. Again, perhaps this is the new way to go. You know, only time will tell. Um, so I'm just coming up to the last few slides now. So I think DAPT duration, treatment, and dropping DAPT is all based on really shared decision making. So <laughs> for every patient, we have to realize, you know, we have to ask the questions, what was his PCI complexity? What was his thrombotic risk? So how many stents, how complex were the lesions, how complex was the treatment we had given? What's our patient's bleeding risk? 
reading risk, again, defined by the document that I had shown you uh, based on age and risk factors. What kind of stent did my patient get? And then there are some um, scores available. The DAP score can be used at 12 months if the score is, it includes certain risk factors. If the score is more than equal to two, then you're, you can probably favor continuing DAP. There's also a precise TAP score, uh, which is usually calculated during the index PCI. And if the score is low, you can probably, you know, you probably favor prolonged DAP again. Again, there are certain risk factors, uh, which I won't go over, that are part of calculating. There are certain evolving concepts now. Um, you know, we don't do much of genotyping or platelet function testing. But there is now data coming up. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a, a big meta-analysis published in Lancet just this month that patients who are getting sort of genotype and platelet function testing guided therapy versus those who are not to escalate or de-escalate their therapy did better. Um, there's also, you know, something that is a little bit underutilized in practice, which is the addition of low-dose rivaroxaban to aspirin. Uh, this has been shown in the ATLAS ACS trial and the COMPASS trial to reduce MACE, uh, even though it increased bleeding. There are some ongoing trials, you know, uh, sort of how low can you go? All the stent manufacturers now want to get approval for short tap, approval for high bleeding risk patients, and, and these are some of them which are ongoing, comparing one versus six months of DAP. Um, and really, thank you to all my attendings for a great past year, and... Uh, really a privilege to train here. Uh, happy to take any questions if, uh, if, if anyone has any. Yeah, thank you, Yash. I'm not sure if I am supposed to panelists, but um, I'm happy to for, for the beginning at least. What I wanted to point out to, and I'm gonna share uh, my screen here quick, is uh, it's very, very nice that you actually pointed this out again because we, I think, I hope you guys can see my screen. Um, this was actually exactly like you said, and in, um, in conjunction with our EP group with Joe Allen and, and Dr. Skate from Raska, that we wanted to get these di guidelines out of on, on our web page in this um, thick document of, I think, 94 uh, pages, but it's, it's within this document that we also have our recommendations very much um, in line with what you just said of uh, high bleeding risk, high ischemic risk and default and just simply have a guideline uh, towards interplated therapy and intercoagulation therapy, your first part of your talk. So if someone is interested, he, they can find that on the, on the webpage. And, and we are trying to put this in our recommendations, obviously, uh, after PCI. So I'm just going to unshare this here quick. Um, but yeah, are there any questions? <laughs> so you think of the Q&A? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I can ask you a question. So if you say, um, you know, the guidelines in parentheses, and then you say, well, I can quote, get away maybe with one or three months based on let's say one trial or two. Um, how do you see you know, our vulnerability as interventional cardiologists, let's say an event happens? What, what do you think is the strongest um, like recommendation that, that we could justify our treatment by? You know, unfortunately, it'll probably have to be guidelines. Um, you know, guidelines are based on randomized trials and well-done meta-analysis and observational studies. But yeah, I think, you know, having three or four well-powered trials showing one month of DAPT is good enough versus, you know, an outdated set of guidelines uh, saying that we probably need longer DAPT. I still think safety would be to hedge towards these outdated guidelines for the time being, um, you know, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I, I'm hopeful that this perhaps will change with time. I mean, there has been some changes in at least the AFib and antiplatelet sort of uh, therapy group, but I think these high bleeding risk and short DAPT uh, patients, um, I think there's still some work to be done, um, at least from the ACCHA guidelines. Mm 
All right, now you uh, initiated many questions. Um, <laughs> so here's uh, maybe not what you just said, but before. So uh, one question here is from uh, Dr. J. How about P2Y12 inhibition testing? Any role of this determine the treatment? So what do you think about? Should we do that now that you talked about it? So very, very interesting. I would say no for the time being. Um, there is some sort of school of thought that's saying that perhaps, you know, you come in, you hit these older patients with, with high ischemic risk, you hit them hard with aspirin brilinta, and then perhaps you de-escalate to clopidogrel and you monitor their P2Y12, uh, you monitor their sort of uh, platelet functions and see if they're okay or not. I would say for the time being, no, but I think this is definitely an, an evolving concept um, uh, going forward in the next couple of years. And then Dr. Burke is asking, is there a scoring system for bleeding risk which has been studied? No. So the, the bleeding risk that I had um, shared um, was essentially based on uh, this expert consensus. There's no, and this was it, this major and minor criteria, uh, but there's no solid evidence. And really, if you look at all the trials on high bleeding risk patients, they have used sort of this major and minor criteria, but yes, no. There is no homo homogeneous sort of well-studied and validated score for defining high bleeding risk. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Katsianis is asking or telling you that it was an excellent talk. And then how do these guidelines relate to radial versus femoral access? I'm guessing he's relating to uh, bleeding risk, maybe acute or post-acute. Yeah, no, I think I think radial, you know, again, theoretically speaking, is is an important bleeding reduction strategy. Uh, in the newer trials, and I, di I did not mention this, but in the newer trials, post-2018, 2019, 2020, actually both arms, whether they were BMS versus DES, or they were short tapped versus maybe six months of DAP, they really did a good job of balancing patients who got both radial and femoral access in both these groups so that we could sort of not have any confounders from access side bleeding contributing to you know, what we would think would be related to DAPT and, and, and stents. So I think, yes, radial is a very important bleeding reduction strategy, but I think the trialist did a reasonable job of, of preventing that from being a confounder. Dr. Travers right. has a question here. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks a lot, Yash. That was great. I was just going to just make a comment that um, that with the um, kind of the merging of the research systems, both at St. Paul and here, and as well as our relationship with the Alina Hospital uh, up in at Mercy, that that there's you know an opportunity for us, the interventional groups, to come together and do some of these uh, these trials within our uh, within our health system, um, and you know maybe this this could spur us on to. To, you know, to cooperate more because we have, you know, a ton of uh, PCI cases between the three metro hospitals. Plus we have a, you know, a, a shared uh, database within a, with Alina. Um, so I would think that, you know, if you, if you were going to think of what, is there a question out there that still really needs to be addressed in your eyes that, you know, say a 5,000 PCI a year uh, group could put together. Yeah, you know, I think that's I think that's a great point. I think there are two questions that we don't have answers to yet. And I think one of them is one versus six months. So, you know, we're talking about one versus 12 months DAPT in patients who are getting interventions for stable ischemic heart disease, but our guidelines have said, hey, six months of DAPT is enough. So why was the trial designed to look at one versus 12 when 12 was not even sort of uh, the guideline or the base limit. So I think one versus six months uh, is, is probably gonna be uh, something to look at uh, for ACS patients, for um, stable ischemic heart disease patients. And, I, and you know, there are a lot of our patients who are getting treatment prior to cancer surgery, colon surgery, cholecystectomy. I think in, the, in this particular high bleeding risk group, pre-op, peri-op, post-op, I think there's not so much data. And I think the other big thing was, you know, we've now learned about aspirin, Plavix, uh, and then, so for example, I showed you trials on P2Y12 only monotherapy, which was Twilight, which was only Ticagrelor. There was another trial where they did only Clopidogrel. Compared that to 12 months of DAPT, we really don't have any arm that says, hey, okay, 
let's give you six months of DAP, let's give you six months of DAP, and then let's say we'll do aspirin monotherapy in one and Brillinta monotherapy in the other, or aspirin monotherapy in one and Plavix monotherapy in the other, and sort of compare how does ticagrelor monotherapy do to aspirin monotherapy. So I think, again, those are probably, probably important trials. I'm not sure how much of this would, um, you know, like the ethics committee, what would they say if you're, if you're doing something that doesn't have much data, you're depriving someone of adequate DAP, or DAP that is questionable. So I'm not sure how that would, how that would play out. And could we even, like Dr. Gessel mentioned, could we even tell our patients, hey, listen, after a STEMI, just do three months of DAPT, and if something happens, then, and out of, you know, out of a, the context of a randomized trial, what are the consequences? I'm not sure. There was one more question here. Um, D58163, I don't know who that is. What would you use with ACSMI and with increased risk of left ventricular thrombus, large aneurysm or akinesis, what would you do there? I think it's a little bit um, an extra question, but I think maybe you can answer that. Sure, so I think if someone has at risk, I don't think there's any guideline to support preemptively anticoagulating these patients. So patient comes with ACS, has a big anterior infarct, and you, know, you see a big aneurysm, I would just do you know, PCI, your 12 months of DAPT, come back for follow-up of course to see if there's a thrombus. Now if there's a thrombus, then obviously your game changes. We don't have data, there was only one small randomized trial on rivaroxaban for use in, uh, in patients with LV thrombus. It was only, it only had 100 patients, so I don't think it's enough to go by. So I think if you have an LV clot, you had an MI, you got PCI, I think you should probably do a month of triple therapy aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, followed by Plavix and Coumadin uh, for a year. And then at, ye at one year, decide if you want to drop the Plavix or continue longer. No, that's what I would do. Good. We are, I think we're coming close to the 8 o'clock hour. Is there anybody else maybe in the room? I don't see any further questions online. Doesn't seem to be the case. So thanks again, Yash. Okay, Congratulations yeah. to your excellent year. Thank you so and, much. Uh, looking forward to working with you another year. Absolutely. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you so much.